Okay, so last week, last week was Mother's Day. I was planning on preaching on uh, just sharing some thoughts in Proverbs 31, but because of the wedding, um, I wasn't, I didn't really feel ready, so um, I just thought I'd uh, share some thoughts with you this week, uh, even though Mother's Day was last week. I don't really, we don't really make a big deal of Mother's Day, but um, it doesn't mean that uh, uh, I think mothers should be underappreciated or anything like that, but um, I think that's something that we can show our mothers uh, anytime. Uh, it doesn't have to be only one day. But I thought I'd uh, just go through Proverbs 31 because Mother's Day did get me thinking about the virtuous woman. So I just wanted to share a couple of thoughts with you in this chapter uh, as we go through it. So we won't, we won't read through it first. We'll just go through each verse as we go and I'll share some thoughts as we go. So if you didn't know, Proverbs 31 is known as the chapter of, of the virtuous woman. If you're wondering what virtue means, virtue is like somebody that's of high moral standing, uh, you know, somebody who uh, um, you know, has very high moral standards is, is somebody who's, I guess, generally a good person, right? Um, so the Bible is describing what this virtuous woman is like. And, and most people think that it only goes from verse 10 onwards, because verse 10 is where it says, who can find a virtuous woman? for her price is far above rubies. Now, even though that starts at verse 10 and then it goes into the explanation about what this virtuous woman does, and as you go through it, it's, it's almost like an impossible standard. You know, I'm sure every woman has read Proverbs 31 and just think, yeah, this woman is like a superwoman. But there are women out there, I think, that could possibly fit you know, this, uh, these, uh, these attributes. And, and even, and we'll see a bit later, where we go to Ruth. Ruth was the woman in the Bible that was actually called and, and identified as a virtuous woman. Uh, but we see here that there are nine verses before verse 10, and we think that uh, only the description of the virtuous woman starts from verse 10. But in fact, the whole chapter is about a virtuous woman because we read here in verse 1 in Proverbs 31, the words of King Lemuel. A lot of people believe that is Solomon, another name for King Solomon, um, as he wrote a lot of the Proverbs. Some people believe that it's an unknown king, like they don't know who this king is, you know, um, and, and, and it's just a, a random king that has, uh, has this proverb in the Word of God. The words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. So isn't it interesting that a lot, of the, a lot of the scriptures in the Bible are direct revelation through that prophet and then they write it down or they speak it, somebody pens it down. Whereas this was actually spoken through somebody's mother. So whether that mother was spoken to them, I mean, we don't know where she got the prophecy from, right? But it's interesting that this chapter is in Proverbs because a mother taught her son the word of God. The words of King Lemuel the prophecy that his mother taught him. And a couple of thoughts there are, um, you know, a mother teaches her children the word of God, right? So it's not just a job for dad, it's a job for mums as well to obviously teach their children the scriptures, teach their children the word of God. Uh, so it's not just a mother's job just to only teach their daughters you know, practical skills. You know, mum might think, oh, you know, my job is just teach her how to cook, teach her how to clean, teach her how to be a good wife. No, no, a mother can also teach her children doctrine. And it's not just a mother just teaches the daughters and the father teaches the sons. We see here that a mother is teaching her son, right? So fathers teach their daughters. It's parents are teaching both their children. They, they can bring both perspectives to the table to make a well-rounded child. So one thing we got to realize as well is church is not enough. You know, like you need to be teaching your children at home about the scriptures, talking about the scriptures. Um, and, and here are some, uh, you know, very famous verses in the Bible where we see from Deuteronomy 6. Uh, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. And these words which, which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up, and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. So we see here, that's why often people will put Bible verses around the house. So it's constantly around, you know, they're talking about it. But we see here that there's not like this set time that, you know, we're going to just sit down and learn the Bible. You can see in the Bible, it's something that happens constantly throughout the day. And this is not the only passage that actually mentions this in Deuteronomy. There's another one in Deuteronomy 11, um, verse 18. 
So he says, therefore shall you lay up these words, these my words in your heart and in your soul. So see, they, first of all, you've got to know the word if you're going to teach it to your children. So that's, that's part of the problem of why we're not getting the word in our children, because parents don't take the time to learn the word, you know, because they're just relying on church too. So it's like people think that if I just go to church once a week, twice a week, then that's enough. That's enough Bible. No, it's not enough. We need to be reading our Bible all the time. We need to be learning about the scriptures, talking about the scriptures with our spouse, but talking about the scriptures with our children as well. And this is how you'll keep up with your doctrine because you're constantly talking about them. So they're in your heart, they're in your soul. You're buying them for a sign upon your hand that they may be as frontlets between your eyes. And you shall teach them, your children, speaking of them when thou sittest in thine house and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. So this is something that happens all the time. You know, it's not that, you know, people get this idea, and I'm not against like family devotions, right? Where they, you know, there's a set time of the week that you might sit down with your family, read the Bible. A lot of people do that sort of thing. But I don't think that's enough either. You know, if it's just like one time a week where your family touches the Bible, I mean, that's not how it should be. You know, the, our Christian life is not at like a moment or a scheduled time. It's a lifestyle. It's something that is a part of you. It's who you are. And part of who you are is the Word of God. And just in conversation, when you're talking about things, the Word of God should constantly be coming in and out of your conversation as you're just talking with your family and talking with your children. And this is how they will learn the most. So you don't just need to have that talk, you know, just talk about it all the time. Learning takes place all the time. The more time you can spend with your children, the more time you can have, you know, to, to teach them the Bible. And this is one advantage of homeschooling. You know, and when I, you know, you know people go back and forth between homeschooling and, uh, you know, Christian schooling or whatever schooling. And, you know, there are, obviously there are pros and cons, you know. But one of the things that are, is a pro for homeschooling versus sending your kids to an institution for six, seven hours a day um, to learn of other people. And I'm not against, you know, having tutors and things like that because, you know, you know, for example, I send my kids to go play soccer. You know, that's a tutor. I don't necessarily um, teach them myself. So I'm not against that. It's the idea that they are away from you for five days of the week for six, seven hours in the day. Um, and that's one of the problems with sending your kids to school is that you do not spend that time with them somebody else spends that time with them. But you can see here that in order to teach your children, have an influence on them, it takes time with them. You need to be, need to be with them, talking with them, influencing them. And the less you do that, obviously the less influence you're gonna have. So that's one advantage of homeschooling is that if you're with your children, hey, it's, 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 you're gonna have a higher effect on them, higher influence, a higher chance that you're going to teach them and instill in them the right morals and the right attitude that they should have of the world and of, of the scriptures and of God and, and all that. All right, let's, uh, let's go on. So let's uh, go back to Proverbs 31. Uh, the words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him, what my son and what the son of my womb and what the son of my vows. So just one thing I, I get from that is that this, this, this king of this mother is born of her. So she didn't go and do something, you know, like surrogacy or things like that. It was actually a son of her, her own womb. So it's not that there's anything wrong with adoption. Adoption obviously is an exception um, to the rule. But we can see here that, you know, this woman has having a natural birth in the sense that she has given birth to this son. Um, you know, surrogacy is not, uh, I don't think, a right thing to do. Uh, what the son of my womb and what the son of my vows. And we can see here that she had this child within marriage. She didn't have this child out of marriage. So the virtuous woman, you know, does not, you know, play the whore and go out and sleep and then have a child and then try and cover it up with marriage. So it's, it's not that you, you, you marry and then you have children. You don't have children and then get married or have children and never get married. That is not what a virtuous woman does. A virtuous woman is somebody that knows that marriage or, or you know, sex happens within the confines of marriage and then that is the result of children. Uh, so what my son, what the son of my womb, and what the son of my vows. And now she goes into giving some advice uh, to this son who is, is actually a king, is King uh, Lemuel. Give not thy strength unto women, nor thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. So I already talked about the fact that it's not just for dads to teach their sons. Right, because you might have this impression that you know it's dad's job to teach the sons about 
you know, uh, getting a woman, you know, how to, write, how to treat a woman, how to be a husband, how to be a father, things like that. No, it's, it's not only for the father to teach their sons. The, the, the mother can also teach the son how to be a godly husband, how to be a godly leader, how to not the dangers that are out there for men. So you see, like a woman doesn't need to be naive and ignorant about what men's struggles are. Just because you may not struggle with it yourself, you may not have personally experienced the struggle of men firsthand, it doesn't mean that you are ignorant and naive about it, that you can't instruct your son what to look out for. So she can see here, hey, you know, she knows that men struggle with lust. Men may struggle and be carried away with, you know, uh, the strange woman. And she's telling him here, hey, give not thy strength unto women. And that could mean that, hey, you know, don't, don't be taken away with the lust and the strange woman. But also, you know, be a man. You know, don't, you're the leader of your house. You need to be a leader. You need to be a strong leader. Don't give that authority away to a woman. You know, don't give your strength away to a woman. Don't let yourself be submissive to a woman. And obviously, that's not just coming down with a strong hand. There's love and, and things like that in order to lead a woman. But there is still the fact that she's encouraging him to be a leader, to not give away his strength to a woman. Uh, Nor thy ways to that uh, which destroyeth kings. So I just want to show you here in Deuteronomy 17 a couple of ways that kings are destroyed. Um, so again, don't, don't uh, you know, teach your sons to be leaders. You know, a virtuous woman is teaching her son, not just teaching daughters. Um, and, you know, mums, mums ought not to spoil their sons. You know, we live in a day where, you know, mums do everything for their kids. And I don't think anyone is like that in, in this room. But, you know, if you are, don't be like that. Where mums just do absolutely everything for their kids. You know, like they cook and clean for them. Uh, you know, they, they don't let them do anything. When, when, and to the point where the kids are like demanding of their parents. They grow up, they're lazy, they're irresponsible. They, they don't know how to be independent. They don't even know how to use a washing machine or anything like that. You know, you need to think about that when you're training your kids, that it's not loving, just do absolutely everything for them. You need to teach them responsibility, get them to do jobs around the house. You know, when your kids want something and they can get it themselves, let them get it themselves. You know, you're their boss. You know, they're not your boss. And, and, and run your household that way, even as a mother, as a virtuous woman, run your house that way, that your children are not the boss. You are the boss and teach them uh, their place in that family. Um, here are some ways which destroy kings. Uh, we see here in Deuteronomy 17, where God never intended a king for the nation of Israel, but it's funny that in Deuteronomy 17, there are laws about when you have a king, you know, this is the sort of king that he should be, because he knows that they're going to already go against his plan of God being the king and having judges. Uh, so it says here in Deuteronomy 17, verse 14, uh, When thou art come unto the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, and shalt possess it, and shalt dwell therein, and shalt say, I will set a king over me, like as all the nations that are about me. And I know that verse is always talked about where, you know, the whole idea of peer pressure that you know, even Israel looking around at all the other nations and not doing what God wants him to do, but looking at your friends, looking at your mates. You know, your friends and your mates are not going to be the best influence and, and the way you want to pattern your life. You know, and it goes for children. It also goes for adults as well in the workforce. You, know, you hang around your colleagues and the way they dress, the way they talk. That's not the standard that you should live by. You should be living by the standard of the Word of God and not looking at all the nations that are about you and wanting to be like them. You should be first and foremost focused on wanting to serve and please God. Uh, thou shalt in any wise, so in, in all, I guess, cases, you would say, um, thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose, one from among thy brethren shalt thou set king over thee, Thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not thy brother. Now here's some things that the king should not do. But he shall not multiply horses to himself. Now when I read that, I, I think it's talking about the fact that he's amassing power, right? He's building up, an, he's building up this huge army. Um, I think that, that's what that's referring to. Uh, multiply horses to himself. So he's after, you know, basically trying to um, build this army like we see, you know, countries like America doing where they build up this huge army and they're trying to, you know, have world domination and the UN trying to take over. Um, 
so not cause the people to return to Egypt. So this is setting a bad example to his, to his kingdom, right? Um, and going back to the lifestyle of Egypt and the paganism and, and, and going away from God. To the end that he should multiply horses for as much as the Lord hath said unto you, so I think what's happening here is basically he's making alliances, right? He's making bad alliances just to gain more power, gain more influence. For as much as the Lord hath said unto you, you shall henceforth, you shall henceforth return no more that way. So that's one thing. So power, neither shall he multiply wives to himself, that his heart turn not away. And that's what we see in Proverbs 31, where she's warning him around, about women. Um, and we see here that is one thing that can destroy kings too when they, when they have multiple wives. And we see David had multiple wives, Solomon had multiple wives. And this is one thing they were not meant to do. Neither shall he multiply wives to himself that his heart turn not away, neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. So we see here, it's interesting that, you know, when people talk about the things that men want to achieve, men strive after is sex, money and power. And these are the three things that destroy the ways that if a king gives himself over to these things, that will destroy him. You know, it's power and it's, um, it's uh, women, sex, and silver and gold, money, riches. Now, how is he going to keep himself from that? Well, it says here, and it shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom. Now, think about when you're sitting on the throne of the kingdom is, is you know, when you're judging your people. You remember Solomon sitting and judging people would come to him and he judged those, uh, those, two, uh, those two prostitutes that came and they were both claiming the, the son was theirs. That he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priests, the Levites. So he's writing his own copy of the word of God. And it shall be with him and he shall read therein all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, to keep all the words of this law and these statutes to do them. So one reason why he's writing this copy of the Bible and he's reading it is so that he would learn it. But also it says here in verse 20, that his heart be not lifted up above his brethren and that he turn not aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, to the end he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. So it was really important for the ruler to know the word of God, to be studying the word of God so that it would keep him humble. And also because he's judging, right? He's sitting on the throne. He needs to know how to judge um, correctly and soundly. So these are some ways which destroy kings, which is what's being uh, uh, warned about in Proverbs 31. Verse 4, it is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. Give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish, and wine unto those that be of heavy hearts. Let him drink and forget his poverty, and remember his misery no more. Open thy, open thy mouth for the dumb in the cause of all such as are appointed to destruction, Open thy mouth, judge righteously, and plead the cause of the poor and needy. Now, I wanted to just read all those, six pas all those six verses together, just to give you some context as I explain what I believe verse 4 and 5 and 6 and 7 um, is talking about. So we see here that the context is judgment, isn't it? Because it's saying, hey, wine and strong drink is not for kings. It's for these certain people. Uh, you know, those that are sorrowful or ready to die. Um, that, that's, a, that's a right area for it. Um, and you should be judging rightly. You need to open your mouth and uh, judge rightly for those that cannot speak and judge rightly and plead the cause for those that are poor or in need. Like you are the balance, like the king or the person that is in charge to judge, they are the balance to protect those that cannot protect themselves, right? Now, there's a couple of views on this passage. It is a bit of a hard passage for people that are against alcohol. Now, I don't want to go too far into alcohol in this sermon. It is something I'm preparing. I do have a view on it. Um, just to summarize, and, and I, don't, I want you guys to have the wrong idea. I personally do not think it's a sin to drink alcohol. I think there is a place for alcohol. Um, I don't think it's a sin just to consume it. Um, but it is a sin to get drunk. So drinking too much alcohol to the point where you get drunk, I believe is the sin that the Bible condemns. Now, where is that line between you know, drinking and then getting drunk? Um, I haven't 100% figured that out yet. Where I'm sort of sitting now is 
I think, I think from what, the more I study the passages in the Bible about wine and about strong drink, um, the more I'm thinking that there are actually like two levels of, you know, I guess, um, you know, the effects of alcohol. It's kind of like, you know, with caffeine, right? Somebody can, somebody can get a bit of a buzz from caffeine and it might be helpful to them, but then they can also be addicted to it to the point where they cannot control that addiction. And I think it's the same with alcohol. I think alcohol, one of the reasons why it's created from my study so far is that it is designed to give that little bit of a buzz so that people are happy. And that's what the Bible talks about. It makes, makes the heart happy and things like that. But then there is a point where you actually get drunk and you actually lose control, you actually utter perverse things, you lose your balance, you, you know, don't remember things that happen um, and you, you know, the body actually is now trying to expel that because you've taken too much and, and that's when you vomit and you spew. Now I know in our circles that is a position that is very controversial because, you know, we're always taught that, you know, alcohol should just absolutely be abstained from and they have their arguments. Um, I don't want to go into it in too in-depth because I, I do want to preach a sermon about it sometime and go through all the verses. But personally, I think it's really hard to defend uh, total abstinence of alcohol. Um, that, that it's, and, and some people actually believe that because wine was given to God as a blessing, to actually not drink it at all, it's almost like you're denying something that God has given mankind to enjoy. You've turned a blessing into something that you know, should be uh, totally avoided, which is, um, it's almost like you know, God's given you a good gift and then you're not using it. So some people, that's why some people do actually argue for that, hey, if it's something that God has given us, then it should, it should be used. And then obviously there's the view that wine in the Bible is just juice and rather than an alcoholic beverage. But this, is, and, but this is one of the passages where it's hard to take that position. And this is where I'm sort of circling back to. So that's my thought on alcohol right now. It's kind of like, I don't think, my position right now is it's not a sin to drink it. It's the quantity in which you drink and how it affects you. Um, and there's obviously things to talk about there. And obviously different passages. There's so much, there's so many passages. I don't even ever looked up the word wine in the Bible. There's not that many occurrences of strong drink, but there's a lot of occurrences of wine. And it's hard to believe that every occurrence of the word wine in the Bible is talking about a non-alcoholic beverage. Obviously, it's some or the other. But whether or not the case can be made that, there, that when the Bible talks about wine, that it's ever talking about a non-alcoholic beverage is, um, I think, a little shaky. But anyways, this is one of the passages that a person who believes that it's a sin to even consume a little bit of alcohol... Uh, this is one of the passages where if somebody takes the position that to consume even a little bit of alcohol is sinful and should not be done, that they would struggle then with this passage, right? Because one, it's saying it's not for kings and it's not for princes to drink strong drink. And they say, hey, there's the warning against drinking alcohol. But then it says in verse six, to give strong drink to people. Now, if it's, if it's a sin to consume any alcohol at all, then how can there be this, this advice in the book of Proverbs to say, hey, you know, it's not for kings, but it's, but it's all right to give it to people that are ready to perish and those that be of heavy hearts. This is, this is a verse they would struggle with. Now, there's two explanations I've kind of heard to explain this away, and then I'll give you what I think these verses uh, mean. One is that they say, well, the use of alcohol might be like a medicinal reason, right? So they might say, you know, like, uh, like Timothy was said to take a little wine for thy stomach's sake um, and, thine, and thine often infirmities and say, yes, so you can consume alcoholic wine because it wouldn't make sense, right, to say, you know, Timothy, just drink a little bit of grape juice, right? Because if it's grape juice, why, why, does, why is there a restriction on the amount he can drink? He can drink a whole cup. He can drink, you know, he can drink like a 600 ml bottle and, you know, you drink a 600 ml bottle of juice, nobody's saying, hey, just drink a little bit, right? You drink a lot, you drink a little bit because... If it's alcoholic, just drink a little bit because then there's, there's the medicinal uh, reasons of the alcohol as well because alcohol can, can kill bacteria and things like that. What was, it, what was it going? Oh, yeah, yeah, medicinal reasons. So one, one position here is that, you know, these people that are you know, either sick, which is not, I don't, it's not, well, they, well, that's what they would equate ready to perish, right? They'll say somebody that's very sick um, as opposed to somebody that's so, just so depressed that they don't want to live anymore. Uh, or somebody that's of a heavy heart. Now, 
If you're using alcohol for medicinal reasons, I can imagine why you would give it to somebody that's ready to perish. If you think ready to perish means somebody that's about to die or somebody that needs to undergo surgery and they need to take it for medicinal reasons. But who's going to give a depressed person like alcohol? You know, like if you, if you believe that alcohol is the only reason for it is to just get drunk and off your face. You know, like generally if somebody's depressed, you know, you wouldn't want to get them addicted to alcohol um, and give them too much. So that's one position, right? One position is, well, it's just a medicinal reason, but then that already would go against the view that it's sin to consume alcohol because th therefore there is an area where it's okay to consume alcohol and you've admitted that it's medicinal. So you can't take the position that it's a sin to totally consume it at all if you accept that you can take it for medicinal reasons. So uh, this is what I don't get about people that are against alcohol because they say that if they take the position that you can consume alcohol for medicinal reasons and you can sip it, yet they call people that sip alcohol wine bibbers. So it's like, which one is it? Like if it's a medicinal reason and they're wine bibbers, you know, you're saying it's okay to give it for medicinal reasons, but if they do, then they're a drunkard. You know, like it kind of doesn't make sense, doesn't, doesn't fit together. So, uh, a second position is that that it's not actually a command. So we don't actually take it literally to say, hey, actually give it to these people. But all it's, but they, they would just say that the thought is that, you know, it's not for kings, it's not for people that like think highly of them, you know, are people in charge and people that are noble. It's for the losers, right, that will drink, that don't want to live anymore, that are of heavy hearts. You know, let, let them, basically saying, you know, the alcohol is for them and let them do what they do with it, which is get drunk and off their face and, you know, remember their misery no more. Like they just smashed off their face that they don't even remember. They're, they're, they're getting away from their hardships. Um, but see, this is not actually what the passage says because the passage says give, give it to them. Do you know what I mean? It's not just saying like let them do what they do. It's saying, you know, it's not for kings and if you have wine, it's for those people. So... I think that's, it's kind of like trying to make this verse fit an explanation of what it doesn't actually say, in, in my opinion. So, so what do I think it's talking about? Well, if, in the, if the position is that, you know, it's, it's okay to drink a little bit of wine, then we can accept, well, there's a, there's a place for it, right? There's a place for people that, you know, they're either ready to perish, so they're depressed and they're, you know, they, um, you know, they're ready to die or they're of a heavy heart, that there's a place where wine can make them happy. Now, I think what the assumption is, is when people read uh, here in verse six, give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish and wine unto those that be of heavy hearts. And then verse seven, <laughs> let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his misery no more. I think when we read verse seven, we picture somebody who's drunk off their face and doesn't even know what's going on, right? But that might not be the case, right? All it's saying here is, hey, let somebody drink wine and strong drink and are they forgetting it because they're so off their face or are they forgetting their positive poverty and their misery because it cheers them up and they're happy for a brief moment? It's like, you know, it's like, let's say you don't have a very good life or you're, you're sad, but then you go to a party, right? And then you're happy. It sort of lifts your spirits and, and you're happy again. You're not thinking about necessarily your poverty and your misery. And this is what I think one of the reasons of of wine might be is that it does have that slightly euphoric effect and that's why it's, nest, it's generally coupled with celebration because people feast, they eat and drink and we even see in the Corinthian church where they're eating and drinking, right? And then one is hungry and another is drunken. So obviously they're drinking something that is alcoholic but yet Paul never rebukes them for drinking the alcoholic drink. He just says, hey, have you not houses to eat and to drink in? So he's even telling them, you can, you can drink it, just drink it at home but you don't come to the house of God and drink too much to the point where you're drunken, and that was the problem. So people generally tend to feast with wine and strong drink, and, and this is why I think it makes the heart glad. Uh, let me show you a couple of verses. Um, in Psalms 4, verse 14. So I know you may not agree with me yet. I know I haven't really covered it in depth, but you know, just to get, at least give you some things to think about. Um, Psalm 104, verse 14 to 15. Uh, he says here, He causeth the grass to grow for the cattle and herb for the service of man that he may bring forth food out of the earth. 
And look, and wine that maketh glad the heart of man, and oil to make his face to shine, and bread which strengtheneth man's heart. So we see here that, and, and this is not the only passage in the Bible that talks about wine making glad the heart, but we see here that wine, you know, whether you, whether you believe it's alcoholic or non-alcoholic, we see here that it makes somebody happy, right? And that's what I think Proverbs 31 is talking about, is that's why, uh, you know, we, we give it to those that are of heavy heart and ready to perish, because somehow this wine has an ability to make somebody happy and forget about their poverty and forget about their misery. But the reason why we can't accept, I can't accept that this is just non-alcoholic grape juice here that we're giving to these people to make them happy, right? Is because it's the same wine and strong drink that a king or a prince should avoid for certain reasons because it's going to pervert his judgment, right? It could possibly pervert his judgment because it says here, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. So what's that talking about? Because obviously a, a place for a prince and a king is to judge because even though the position could be that you, know, you can have some slight effects of alcohol and it can affect your judgment, is that necessarily drunkenness? And is that what the Bible is condemning? But does that mean that it's okay then for somebody who is in a position where they need to do a serious task where their judgment will affect and afflict those that need them to judge righteously, is it right for them to just be blasé about the effects of alcohol? In the sense that they need to be aware of how alcohol affects their judgment, and then if the rulers and the leaders are drinking, then they can actually end up perverting judgment. And we see here in Isaiah 28, Isaiah 28 verse 7, says here, but they also have erred through wine and through strong drink are out of the way. The priests and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They are swallowed up of wine. They are out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. And look at this. It's because they're drinking too much. For all tables are full of vomit and filthiness so that there is no place clean. Uh, let me show you another passage. Um, Isaiah 5, verse 22. Because notice in Proverbs 31, it's only saying that the kings and the princes should, should not drink strong drink. But is it all the time? Remember the, the context of Proverbs 31 is saying because they need to judge righteously and they need to open their mouth to take care of the poor and the needy. So I think what Proverbs 31 is talking about is warning She's warning her son, hey, you're a king, you need to rule righteously, you need to make judgment, you need to beware of the dangers of drinking strong drink, because if you do, then you can pervert judgment. Uh, Woe unto them that are mighty to drink. So these are the rulers in charge. And men of strength to mingle strong drink, which justify the wicked for reward and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. So you see here that the strong drink is making them err in judgment and making them pervert judgment. Uh, let's go here. Ecclesiastes, I'm just going to show you this passage because I believe this is uh, referring to as well uh, when they feast and when you feast there is food and wine generally at these feasts. It says, Woe to thee, O land, when thy king is a child and thy princes eat in the morning. Now, this is not obviously talking about eating breakfast in the morning. It's not saying that, you know, woe to the land because the, the prince and king had toast in the morning. You know, this is talking about woe to them because they, they're not, they're not uh, treating seriously their position of being a judge in the land. And, they're, you know, they're, obviously they're rich, they're rulers, and they're always feasting. So it's like they wake up morning, they're feasting, they're always drinking, and they're not doing their job properly as a ruler. Blessed art thou, O land, when thy king is the son of nobles, and thy princes eat in due season. So you see that there's a, there's a time for feasting. There is a time when there's a celebration, but it's not... The problem is, is that if the rulers are doing it all the time, then, they, then they're not going to judge. They, they might pervert judgment because, you know, it's not like you're just happy-go-lucky all the time. If you're a ruler, you need to treat that job seriously. 
Ah, uh, blessed art thou, O land, when thy king is the son of nobles, and thy princes eat in due season for strength and not for drunkenness. So we see there that the eating is not just talking about just food, because when they eat too much or they eat out of season, um, or when they're drinking too much, you know, and they're just feasting all the time, they're doing it for the wrong reasons, just to get drunk. By much slothfulness the building decayeth, and through idleness of the hands the house droppeth through. And look at this, a feast is made for laughter, and wine maketh merry. So this is what I, I believe that the previous two passages were talking about, or the previous two verses were talking about, the eating, and the eating in due season, not for laughter. Um, oh, sorry, and not for drunkenness. So they're obviously drinking some sort of alcoholic wine. But it says, a feast is made for laughter, and wine maketh merry, but money answereth all things. Uh, so that's personally what I think Proverbs 31 is talking about. Let's go back there. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's not, uh, that's, that's just what I've come up with now. I mean, I don't, I don't know if that's the right interpretation, but as I study more and more the passages on wine and just, just trying to make it all the wine passages fit grape juice, um, it's a little bit difficult. And then you've got also the fact that strong drink was allowed in Deuteronomy 14. Um, you know, the fact that Jesus, you know, sat and drank wine, you know, if he just drank grape juice, why was he being accused of being a wine bibber? These, just these sort of things just don't make sense. There's a lot of things that it's kind of like, oh, I don't know, it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a shaky argument if every um, you know, time wine is spoken of uh, positively that it's a non-alcoholic beverage. Anyway, let's continue. So that's what I think that's talking about. The context is judgment. And because she's teaching this king, She's saying, hey, you know, it's not for kings and princes to drink strong wine and to drink, to drink wine and drink strong drink because they need to judge righteously. And, you know, even though wine may make you happy and wine may give you this slight euphoria, that's not the state you want to be in if you are actually to sit and judge because your job is to protect people and not err through wine and strong drink. And this is why it's saying here that it's all right, there's a, there's a place and a time of when people can drink strong drink and can drink wine because there is that effect that it makes the, the, the heart happy. And that's why it's saying here that you give strong, strong drink and wine unto them that are perish and wine unto those that be of heavy hearts. So it's not, it's not encouraging drunkenness. It's not saying give it to them so they'll just you know, get smashed off their face. What it's saying here is that wine does make the heart happy so they can drink and celebrate or, you know, be happy and not necessarily think about, you know, how terrible something is happening, whether they lost their money or they lost a loved one. Open thy mouth for the dumb in the cause of all such are as appointed to destruction. Open thy mouth, judge righteously and plead the cause of the poor and needy. So what these verses, I believe, are talking about is it gives further context into why kings and princes should be wary of alcohol. But also, it's an exhortation to, to speak up, isn't it? It's an exhortation to speak up. And, and I don't think this, this is only for kings, in the sense that as Christians, we ought to speak up. You know, we ought to, to speak up and make known what we believe and not be shy, um, so that we can speak up for those that can't speak for themselves, but especially for those that are in governing positions or that are rulers and princes, they especially should be opening their mouth and not being quiet when abominations like, ab like abortion happen. You know, like the abortion is the killing of innocent babies that cannot speak for themselves. And this is where rulers will be held accountable by God, I believe, because their job is to protect those that are appointed to destruction. You know, those that cannot plead for themselves and they need to please for the poor and needy. So we need to speak up, don't be silent about our faith. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. Um, uh, let's go on. So you can see here that Proverbs 31, <clears throat> it's not just about this example of this virtuous woman, but it's also about a mother teaching her son um, how to be uh, you know, a God-fearing uh, person and a, and a righteous ruler. Even though she's just the mother, she can influence somebody that's in power. Proverbs 31.10. Now we get on to the actual example of the virtuous woman. So it says here in verse 10, Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far abro above 
rubies. So the first thing that we can glean here is that virtue far outweighs physical riches and beauty, doesn't it? Because it, we know later on that it says beauty is vain and things like that. So virtue is something that is very valuable, even more valuable than physical riches. And one thing we can also learn from this is that a virtuous woman is very rare because it's saying, I mean, it's a rhetorical question, right? Who can find a virtuous woman? Because a virtuous woman is not easy to find, you know, and even now today. But, but a beautiful woman is easy to find. There's plenty of beautiful women out there, but not a lot of virtuous women um, because a virtuous woman is rare. Um, you know, most... Most, you know, when I say a beautiful woman is not rare, it's because I believe, you know, most healthy women, if they sort of just looked after themselves, if they, um, you know, took care of what they eat, you know, like we, we live in a world where it's very easy for women to be overweight because, you know, there's a lot of bad things to eat at the store, you know, you eat, easy to eat a lot of sugar, a lot of sweet drinks. It's very easy to be lazy as well because we have technology, we have things, we have machines that do things for us. So it's, it's very easy for a woman to not take care of. Same with a man. It's, a, it's, an easy, it's easy for a man to let himself go as well in the world that we live in. But if somebody takes care of their health, right, they, they think about what they eat, they're active, they, they make sure they're doing some sort of activity, whether it's a sport or they're exercising, generally women that are just, you know, healthy are attractive. You know, you don't have to be this supermodel skinny girl to be attractive. You know, generally women that are just healthy are attractive. And that's why I don't think it's rare for a woman to be beautiful. You know, it's, there, there are many beautiful women in the world. And a, a lot of women, if they, you know, it's a, it's a 21st, first world, 21st century first world problem of people being overweight. It's not something really in third world countries. They don't struggle with being overweight because they're constantly active. They're constantly, you know, uh, you know strengthening themselves, doing exercise. And if that's the case, you know, women, you know, are attractive. You know, those, those women. And you see it on, I don't know if you guys see those sort of videos on YouTube where, you know, you know women, like a, a woman might be overweight or a man might be overweight and they sort of purpose in their heart, you know, like they, they want to do something about their health. So they do like this 30 day challenge or 60 day challenge. And, and those videos are really inspiring, aren't they? You watch those YouTube videos, it's like day one, day two, they're struggling. And then like day 15, they're like starting to run really far. And they start to lose weight. And then you see that the end result after like 30 or 60 days, they've lost so much weight and they're actually a very attractive person. But at the very beginning, they, they weren't just because they were a little overweight. So that's what I mean. Like, I, I don't think a beautiful woman is rare. It's just very easy in our day and age for women to, to not take good care of themselves. Um, and even like if you're, a woman is pregnant, I don't think that's necessarily an excuse too because a lot of women, you know, they give birth to a child and they, they let themselves go as well in the sense that, you know, they might get lazy or they, you know, some cultures, I know in Asian culture as well, if a woman's pregnant, they don't like let her do anything, like just sit around. They, they, there's a joke in Asian culture that a pregnant woman, she's kind of like, like, a, like an endangered species, like a panda, like they're just taken care of, it's just like food comes to her, like doesn't do any work around the house, that kind of, don't, don't get her to lift anything. To, but then that's why women, when they get pregnant, they put on so much weight because everyone's like, you know, giving them food and everyone's doing everything for them. And then they, sometimes they put on weight. Now, I'm not discounting the fact that, you know, obviously people might have some genetic dispositions and things like that, but not, not, not like 90% of the population, right? When like everyone is putting on weight, they're, they're not all like have these genetics that um, have this problem. And, you know, there's so many YouTube videos out there of people that are overweight and they, they lose the weight if they, they put in the work and they, they start thinking about their diet. So that's not rare. But a woman that is a virtuous woman that fears the Lord, you know, that, that is rare. Let's uh, look at this verse in 1 Peter. And I probably won't get through this passage. I'll just continue next week. Um, 1 Peter 3, verse 3. It says, he, he who, who's adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plaiting the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on apparel. But let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. Look at this, which is in the sight of God of great price. You know, because it doesn't take, it doesn't take a lot of talent, I think, to be beautiful. Do you know what I mean? And yes, people can become like really skillful at putting on makeup and 
you know, making a lady that, you know, doesn't have, you know, you see these tutorials on YouTube where the lady is, you know, not the most slender lady, but then they can put on makeup to make themselves look slender. That, I mean, that probably does take a lot of skill, right? But in terms of just somebody that's just, just looking attractive, she's just, just, she's just, she's just a regular weight. Like, it doesn't take a lot of skill, right? It doesn't take a lot of skill to, you know, go to the hairdresser, you know, get your hair cut, you know, so you look nice and things like that. You know, put on clothes to, to make yourself attractive to men. I mean, that does not take skill at all. Um, but it does take work and it does take a certain amount of character to be a virtuous woman, which is somebody that works hard and fears the Lord. And this is what God values. God values the inward man more than he values the outward. And he's even saying, hey, what makes you beautiful? You're adorning. People shouldn't think the only reason why you're beautiful is because you have nice hair and you've got jewelry and you've got nice clothes. Like, and is, is, is that the image that you put off as a girl? You know, as a woman or as a girl, is this what you want people to think? This is what God is discouraging. He's saying, I don't want people to just think you're beautiful because you know how to do your hair, because you know how to do your makeup, you know how to do your nails, and you, and, and you know like, how, to, how to put on clothes that make people attractive to you. God's saying, what I want to be beautiful about you is the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. So it's even how you present yourself, how you talk and things like that. That is what is of great price to God and what should be valued in the eyes of the sort of man you want to attract. Um, so as a man, like if you marry a woman for beauty and not virtue, you'll be, you'll be making a huge mistake. You know, the, the, the most... And, and, and those of us who are married, you know, we know that, you know, your, your, obviously the reality of it is your, your wife is not as beautiful as the day you met her and things like that because you, you, it's familiarity, right? So if you marry a woman just for beauty, it'll be a huge mistake because that beauty fades in an instant, especially if that woman does not fear God. If she doesn't want anything to do with God and she is as far from a virtuous woman as can possibly be, it'll be a very short period of time where that beauty uh, will fade off uh, and go away. Proverbs 31. Let's go back to Proverbs 31. Verse 10. Who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies? The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. Now, one thing that's interesting about these verses is that, you know, how many times in the Bible we are told to trust in the Lord, not to put trust in man. And even though this passage does not say to put your trust in your wife, it's interesting that the virtuous woman, the husband of the virtuous woman, his heart can safely trust in her, even though the Bible commands us not to trust in man, right? To trust in the Lord. Although he, can, he has faith, he, he's able to trust her, in what sense? So that he shall have no need of spoil. Now, spoil here is not that, like, you know, when you talk about spoil, like something going off or something going wrong, that sort of spoil. Spoil in the Bible, if you think about it, is the spoils of war. Like, he doesn't need to, to make a ton of money. He doesn't need to get, always get lucky in his business because why? Because his wife is spending all his money on just useless things and spending it all. He can trust his wife to manage the finances of the house and to take care of the money. And, you know, how often do we see in relationships where the husband is making a lot of money and the wife is wasting a lot of money? This is not an attribute of the virtuous woman. The virtuous woman does not just think, hey, my husband's making a lot of money, therefore I can spend a lot of money. No, the virtuous woman is saying that, hey, even though my husband is making a lot of money, I'm still going to be uh, um, wise with the household finances that my husband can trust me with the credit card. You know, so as a woman, do you waste money? Do you waste money on excessive clothes, shoes? Uh, you know, I know women, you know, they, they get into cloth diapering on the internet and then they go crazy with cloth diapering and they, they just buy so many cloth diapers that their child doesn't even use them all because they just want the latest pattern and they want the latest style and they want this. That's not what a virtuous woman does. A virtuous woman just doesn't waste this money on unnecessary things um, because she has this vice to go buy things. You know, often women, they'll go to the shops 
and they feel like they, they, they didn't accomplish something if they don't come home with, with something that they've bought. Like they can't just go to the shops and come back with things that they need. They have to go out and buy something in order to feel that they've done, done something that day. This is not an attribute of a virtuous woman. You know, don't waste money. You know, think about this, like, you know, does your husband need to give you a credit limit? Like, does he need to put a limit because he doesn't trust how much you're going to spend? Like, he gives you a card and it's only got 500 bucks in there or it's only got $50 in there. Because if he gives you, any, if he gives you unlimited amount, then he's, he's going to be worried that he can't pay the bills, can't pay the mortgage because you spent it all. Is that, is that the sort of woman you are? You, you, you're, you're not going after and being a virtuous woman if your husband can't trust you with the finances. Um, you know, think about couples that have separate bank accounts. You know, I'm never somebody that's for separate bank accounts because I'm just like, well, you're one family, you're one flesh. You know, why are you still treating your finances separately? See, so I personally, you know, I, you know, I can trust Elizabeth. I don't trust. I can trust her not to waste money. And we just have the one bank account. Like she has the card. She can. She, she's even a single signatory. So if she wanted, and I did it that way because you know, if I die for any reason, then she can go and get the money out, and, and it's her account as well. But I trust her with that. I don't trust that she's gonna like take out the money and run away and, and put it, you know, in another bank account, you know, leave the country, go back to Mexico or whatever. You know, so it's you know, this is the this is this is the sort of woman you want to strive to be so that your husband can trust you with these things. Um, and it says here that she would do him good and not evil all the days of her life. So it's something that she is striving to do all the time, not just sometimes, that she is good to him. Now, one thing you'll notice, even up to this point about the virtuous woman, is that she's married with children, isn't she? She's a married woman and she has children because when she's teaching children at the beginning and even she's providing for her household later on, so she's a woman that is married with children. And I understand that not every woman is married and not every woman can have ch children, but that doesn't mean that that's not something that should be desired because it's the will of God. Um, let's go to 1 Timothy verse 5, and we'll go down to verse 14. And I even remember growing up, you know, going, you know, in church after I got saved, growing up as a teenager, growing up as a young adult, and going to these youth camps. And you go to these youth camps, and, and people, they, they either talk about two things. It's either like boy-girl relationships, which is, you know, how do I find a spouse? How do I, you know, what's the right way to date? But they're also thinking about what God's will is for my life. You know, what does God want me to do with my life? And that's not always an easy question to answer, you know, when, when there can be a multitude of opportunities, especially for a man. But see, for a woman, the, the, the decision is easy. It's an easier path because God actually tells a woman, he, he's, he, he's very clear in the Bible, what his will is for young women. And he says here, I will therefore that the younger women marry bear children, so it's in that order, we talked about that, it's marry then bear children, it's not bear children then marry. I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. This is the will of God for a young woman. God doesn't want women chasing careers and chasing all that to the expense of being a mother and guiding the house. And it's not that God doesn't want you to have fun, you know, he doesn't want you to chase you know, your dreams and your goals. It's that we realize in the Bible that people are what are valuable and raising the next generation is what's valuable. And this is actually a high calling of God that the woman ought to raise her children and guide the house so that like in Proverbs 31, she can have the most effect on her children. And we talked about you know, teaching your children and things like that because it's the man's responsibility in the Bible to earn that living. So there's no, there's no question about what the will of God is for a young woman. It's, it's clear as day in the Bible, and it's something that should be valued. You know, don't get deceived by the world, in, you know, when they say, oh, you know, you're just a housewife, you know, you're just a mom. That's, that's a lie from the devil because, you know, the Bible, the Bible exalts women in the, in the sense that the role of a mother and a wife is, is very valuable. You know, the virtuous woman is a is a mother and she is a wife and the bible says that she's she's more valued far above rubies right so you might be this woman and you're trying to like you know be the ceo or the president and make all these riches get all this power but the bible's saying here hey if you're if you're a woman that's trying to be a mother you know be good to your to, to your husband 
that is more valuable to God than this person that can, you know, run a, a multi-billion dollar company, a multi-million dollar company. <clears throat> so don't be deceived by the world into thinking that that pathway is more valuable than this. And this is why God wants them to do it. He wants them to do it because this is, this is the best pathway and the most valuable pathway uh, for a young lady. Um, let's go back. Yeah, I'll just maybe do one more. Uh, Actually, I might, I might end it there because as I go into the next one, it talks about like her work and I wanted to give you some thoughts there um, and that might take a bit of time. All right, we'll end, we'll end it there. All right, let's pray. All right, thank you, Lord. Thank you for your word. Um, I pray uh, that we um, were edified tonight um, and encouraged. Pray, Lord, that, um, you know, it's just a, such a just great passage, uh, especially for ladies. It gives them direction on um, the example to follow. You know, a lot of ladies in their life, um, you know, may not have, um, you know, the best of examples. Not all our families, uh, you know, are Christian families. Um, not all our families are, you know, God-fearing families. And, you know, we often look to people um, in order to be our example. But we thank you, Lord, that we have examples in the Bible of godly men, godly women, um, and things that they did. And we can glean into the wisdom that you've given us on how we are to pattern our lives. Pray, Lord, that you protect us from the devil, protect us from his influences. Uh, Lord, uh, there is an attack on the things that we ought to value as Christians. Um, you know, family, marriage, um, you know, our roles as husband and wife. Um, pray, Lord, that you would protect us and uh, give us the wisdom to not be deceived uh, by the world. That, Lord, we would um, know what we believe and why we believe it, Lord, as we study your scriptures. And, and understand why this is the best, best pathway you have for us. Help us have that faith, Lord, to, to accept your word and pray, Lord, as we continue to, to study and continue to grow as a church, that, uh, Lord, we would uh, create a community where you know, we can raise our families and, and it would be a, an environment that is pleasing to you. We thank you, Lord. Um, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.